Okay, it is the top of the hour. Uh, so I welcome everyone to the Open Library Community Forum. The forums provide an opportunity for the library community, community to learn about folio and related activities. They are a place to come together and discuss issues related to library services and management issues and how to leverage information technology to address these issues. Uh, we do have a code of community conduct on the, our website, uh, so everyone should feel welcome to participate. The forums are hosted by the Open Library Environment, Belay, every two weeks. You can register for these events by joining our mailing list or at folio.org. We hope to construct a series of interesting topics and discussions that inform the development of the Folio Services platform. Today's forum is a chance to gain insight into the Folio platform from index data developers and architects who have been developing the platform. Our panelists will cover the architecture, technologies, and how to get involved in coding in the Folio ecosystem. We'll be taking questions at the end of their presentation, but feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box uh, while we're ongoing. Today we'll have four panelists and we'll open with brief int introductions from each. First up is Sebastian Hammer. Sebastian? Thanks, Jack. Uh, yes, I'm Sebastian Hammer. I'm a, uh, a co-founder of uh, Index Data. I've been with Index Data since it started about 22 years ago. Um, um, and I think that's it for me. Uh, Jacob? Thank you, Seth. Uh, my name is Jacob Scottson, and I'm a, uh, a software architect and technical project manager with Index Data. I've been with Index Data for about eight, eight years now. So a long time. Uh, I'm Kurt. Now we may not have Kurt on at the moment, uh, but I'll speak. Uh, this is Peter Murray. I'm the open source community advocate at Index Data, uh, and I've been with Index Data for six weeks. Uh, pass it back to you, Jack. Uh, Kurt, did you find your, your sound? Yes, um, I'm here. Uh, are we doing the introductions? Yes. Uh, okay, should I uh, give mine? Oh, yeah, Kurt, sure, Kurt sure. had his uh, virtual machine just crap out on him just now, so let's hope that doesn't yeah, again. So, um, um, Hopefully I'm good now, but uh, my name is Kurt Nordstrom. I've been with Index Data since uh, I guess about the um, end of January um, is when I when I uh, signed on. But I am a software engineer developer, and I have been working on some of the architecture and apps for the Folio platform. All right, uh, thanks everyone, and welcome to all. Uh, Sebastian, uh, you can go ahead and start on the presentation. All right. Thank you. Peter, will you give me the, the, the little ball? Yes, I will. All right, getting the ball. There we go. There you go. And here I go. I think, did I get that working? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you everybody for coming uh, and for spending the time with us this uh, this morning or afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. Um, so again, I'm uh, I'm uh, Sebastian. Uh, my job is to uh, try to give a, uh, a a quick sort of introduction to who Index Data is and a little bit of background and context to what it is that we're trying to do with. Um, with the platform and then otherwise get out of the way as quickly as I can for Jakob and Kurt who will be uh, providing the real meat. Um, so I'm gonna start by just giving you like a, a sort of very quick synopsis of, of who Index Data is for folks who don't know. Um, we were founded in 1994, so we are just around 22 years old this year. Um, we were originally started in Copenhagen by myself and a friend. Um, and we became sort of by happenstance a global company when I relocated to the US about 12 years ago. Um, 
and today we are uh, an, an oddly global little team. We are about 20 people in roughly half a dozen different countries. Um, very many of us working from home. In fact, almost all of us except a small core group in Copenhagen. Um, so Jakob is the only one of us that's still in Denmark and is actually in an office. Um, we we make software for libraries. That's kind of how I've introduced myself ever since we started the company. If people asked what I did, I would say we make software for libraries. I make software for libraries, and I must have said that line over a thousand times at this point, um, in all kinds of weird situations. And and really, that's kind of that's kind of how we are, what we are, and how we've evolved. Um, we we make software. Um, 90% of the software we've written over the years, we have released as open source software. Um, we've created it as part of projects we were doing with other people. We've created it because we needed it ourselves, and we've released it because uh, it seemed the best way to get it out there and to enable collaborations with other people, um, organizations, and libraries, and vendors. So. We have we have worked with ILS vendors, with content providers, and other companies over the years, um, and built tools and built all kinds of little things that kind of glue together different pieces of of um, of, of how libraries work. And uh, with this project, we are we are kind of getting to do that, uh, but bigger. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of our stuff historically has been open source tools that we made available to other people, and, and I think we bring some of that sort of tool approach to uh, to how we're trying to put this platform together as well. Um, we've done a bunch of work in standards uh, for interoperability, for representing different kinds of data structures that are relevant to information and information retrieval and so on. And, and we have done a lot of work involving collaborations between different kinds of organizations in research projects and co-development projects and so on with different companies and different types of libraries and groups of libraries coming together. Um, so in, in many ways, we feel we feel very at home in, in this project. It, it feels like something that really fits into our culture and, and, and where we are. Um, so what, are, what is it that we're trying to do with, with the platform? The role that we play in this collaboration that has been sort of seeded by uh, the Olay group of libraries and EBSCO and, and ourselves. Our role is to put together the initial platform on which we will be building um, library management functionality. Um, and our time up to this point has really been focused 100% on that platform. So we will be saying almost nothing, if not nothing at all, about sort of library workflows today, uh, uh, ILS-type functionality. Our focus really is, up to this point, on the platform. Um, and let me say a little bit about how we're approaching that and, and, and why we do it. Um, some of you will have seen this slide. I've, I've shown sort of variations of this in different contexts. It kind of represents some of the basic ideas that were brought to us by Olay and by EBSCO and that, that we've pitched in in terms of, of what what qualities we wanted this platform to have. Um, we want it to be something that can be hosted by anyone. Uh, uh, we want it to be able to, 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 we want a library or a developer to be able to stand this up locally on a local machine. We want a library to be able to host it for itself. We want library networks or groups of libraries to be able to host it for each other. And we also want to enable commercial companies to potentially host this platform for, for groups or libraries or for libraries. Um, we are aiming for a really open license, uh, a permissive license to enable everybody to have an equal footing and everybody to use the software. We have thought very hard about trying to design the platform to facilitate community engagement as much as we possibly could. Um, and into a couple of aspects of how we approach that. Um, it's been a core aspect of this project that we were basing it on on current needs and a current recognition recognition of library roles, but but we also saw it as really central to this project that we wanted to be able to pursue change and innovation and experimentation and growth. Um, we were we have we have been very keen to avoid 
simply building another ILS because we don't think there is a need for another ILS. There, there's lots of them. What we've been really trying to do with this project is to kind of enable a completely different approach to, um, to, to collaborating around functionality for libraries. Um, and the main mechanism for this is this notion of modularity. Um, taken kind of a step further than I think it, it really has been taken by any previous library service platform and really in a direction that isn't that common even for, for sort of hosted platforms in general. This, this notion of extending or really building out functionality upon the platform using an App Store paradigm. So it's been very much inspired by the ability of a uh, smartphone to be kind of a chameleon to take on different roles for different people to grow over time in ways that the original developers of that phone couldn't have predicted. Um, and very importantly to allow many loosely coupled teams and groups and developers to work together but not getting in each other's ways. Um, so those are some of the core ideas. I want to dip into kind of a couple of aspects of what I think are sort of the, the, the grounding principles of the um, of the platform, and you will see both Jakob and Kurt dive deeper into these, but, but this is a little bit of background of, of why we've made some of these choices. Uh, so the first of it is the notion of modularity, the, the, the notion of kind of not only kind of putting an app store, a, a phone-inspired app store in the clouds, which in and of itself isn't all that common, but also taking it kind of a step further. Um, first of all, when we talk about an app store, what we really mean is that there can be lots of different, let's call them apps, modules of functionality um, available in a given cloud-hosted instance of this platform at any given time. Um, these apps can be activated on a tenant by tenant basis. So if an instance of the software is hosted for 10 different libraries, each of those 10 different libraries can activate completely different and potentially overlapping or conflicting apps, and they each exist in their own space. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the App Store notion of things. The apps can range everywhere from what you might expect on a phone, something that takes control of the entire sort of screen or web browser, but there can also be widgets that exist within a, 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 a containing app, if you will. And there can be back-end extensions, so there can be, for instance, a plugin that enables support for a given protocol or integration with a given external service, an authentication mechanism, a, 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 an external sort of financial system, or an external uh, um, part of the supply chain for materials and so on. Um, so when we talk about apps, it's, it's, it's kind of broad, and, and the term itself is potentially misleading. Um, it's both entire apps, it's widgets that can be plugged into those apps, it's, it's extensions on the back end. Um, and the, 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 the sort of set of potential extension points or, or, or types of widgets, if you will, is itself dynamic in the sense that if you create an app, you can decide what sorts of uh, hooks you want to add to that app for extensions, and that then becomes kind of a thing that people can develop against. Um, so the notion of, of, of uh, if, if, and if you create an app and that, that app needs to be able to talk to certain kinds of backends, you can create APIs to enable or to abstract away those, and people can code against that API to build support for new types of backends and so on. So the idea is really that, that um, those kinds of, 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 of interfaces or extension points become part of how the platform grows over time. And, and Jakob will, will explore this in much more detail. So, so, but, the, but the notion really is that the platform is extensible and the mode in which it can be extended is in a way itself extensible. Why are we doing this? Um, uh, there's no doubt that, that trying to build an application or, or, or a set of functionality this way it's going to be trickier than it would have been to just build this in the conventional way as a piece of monolithic software. Um, we are breaking some new ground, we believe, and, and we are going to be running fast, we expect, uh, to figure out um, as we start to build apps for this thing how the very many ways that we're going to break it. Um, so, so we're not making life easier for ourselves. We, th we think that 
by doing this, we can enable collaboration in a very different way than you could with a monolithic piece of software. The idea is really to allow different people to come together as, as loosely coupled teams, if you will, and collaborate just enough to make things work together, but no more than that. Right, so the idea is, is you know, if, if we think about the App Store concept as it unfolds on a, on a smartphone, apps on a smartphone are fairly independent. The, the ways in which they can, they can talk to each other, the ways in which they can exchange data are fairly circumscribed. Our sense is that because we really are, we are groups that are collaborating more closely within this domain than, than we would expect sort of out in the wilderness of, of your local smartphone, there is a need for more collaboration. There's, there's a need for workflows that can pass from one app to another. There's a need for data to flow in a richer way between these different types of, of, of functionality. And, and, and for that reason, we need this, this, uh, this, this kind of richer infrastructure, if you will. Another way is to allow for experimentation. We, we haven't figured out. We have, we have no illusion that we know how this will, will unfold. So we really are trying to create a platform that will allow for for experiments, for prototyping, for, for, for playing with different ideas of what can be done in this context um, by many different groups and potentially with many different ends in mind, whether that's to meet sort of existing library workflow needs or something new. Um, so that's the basic idea. Uh, the other concept that we have worked on, this notion of really trying to keep the design and the approach to the platform very minimalist, uh, very lightweight. Um, so we have sometimes said that we are, we are inspired by microservices concepts. Um, that can lead to a little bit of confusion because we are also doing some things that are not probably orthodox sort of microservices. But we really like the idea of people being able to build out functional logic in a way that's independent, that allows you to use your own software stack, your own development stack, then couple that piece of functionality together with functionality built by other people. And the thing that binds the two together is the interface between them. Uh, so interfaces take precedence. They are, they are more important than the implementation. Um, and we have an ecosystem where you can approach things in many different ways. Um, the way that we would ultimately tie that together in a cloud-hosted environment would be to wrap implementations of business logic in something like Docker containers. Um, could be done in other ways, but that's a, a, an easy way to kind of streamline deployment of, of things that have been built in this way. Um, another kind of core idea from the design is that we want, we want everything to be replaceable. We're trying to avoid building pieces of componentry for the system that are so big that replacing them becomes impossible. Uh, we are very much approach, approaching this as something where, again, the, the, the interfaces between things, the APIs between things, the data models are critical, and we want to try to avoid ending up with a, with a large uh, pile of code that would be impossible to, um, to, to replace. So we're trying to minimize technical debt, in a sense. The purpose of this approach, um, First of all, I think it, it's an approach that we feel very comfortable with. Um, we like the idea of avoiding a really heavy infrastructure. We like the idea of of, um, of, um, of of keeping things light. We found ourselves that when we build out architectures based on open interfaces, that they tended to live for a longer time than individual monolithic pieces of software. They tended to be able to morph and change over time as requirements changed. So there's this sense of sort of longevity and vitality in a way because our expectation is that a platform built this way may still exist in 15 years even though the types of things that people do with it might be different and individual components may have been replaced. Um, and the other one is, is engagement. We, we really would like to be, so we can build out this platform, we can build a set of apps um, for this to make it uh, a, a fully serviceable library service platform with just our team and a small group of, of people working with us. But that wouldn't be as fun. And we, th we think that we wouldn't be able to do as much as we could if we could engage a larger community around working with this platform. So, so we are making really kind of a bid for saying this is a way to collaborate around building things that libraries can use in their operations or use to provide services. Um, so, so we'd like to 
to try to inspire engagement and, and in thinking about how to lower the bar of engagement, really one thing that we've kind of come up with is that you need to put as little as possible um, in the way of people. Uh, and, and, and that's a, a guiding principle of this. Um, so that's really what I have. I'm, I'm going to hand off to, to Jakob and he'll talk a little bit about the, the, the architecture more uh, more specifically, uh, and then we're going to uh, to hand off to to Kurt and talk about what this actually looks like if you uh, were to be into code on this, and, and we're going to explore uh, dive a little bit into to the UI technology that we are, are looking to put together, and then at the very end I'm going to hand off to Peter who will talk about um, uh, the, our plans for opening up the the GitHub repos and the various types of ways that you can um, you can interact with this project. So with that, I'm going to hand off to um, to Jakob. I'm going to I'm going to try to give you the thing, Jakob. Thank you, Seth. Uh, yeah, if you can pass me the presenter's ball. Yeah, I'm just getting into a whole thing here. All right, and, and while they're doing that, um, I'd like to remind everyone that if you do have questions, uh, feel free to submit them, and we'll get to them at the end. All right, so I hope you guys can see this on your screens. Um, so my name is Jakob Skotsen. I'm, uh, I'm an architect with Index Data. And I'll just try to follow up on some, uh, some of the areas that SAP has already uh, talked about and then sort of dive uh, into the architecture a little bit. Uh, after that, Kurt, uh, uh, our software uh, developer, will, uh, will try to show you uh, a little bit in, in more practical terms. Um, the technology that we're talking about here. All right, so let me get started. Um, so just to kind of summarize the goals, um, the purpose of the project is to is, is to really build a community and a marketplace uh, for, for library services. Um, and the technical approach that we have needs to support that. Uh, so, so we're building a, a highly decentralized modular system uh, where you can provide different services, uh, vendors and and smaller developers will be able to provide services, and libraries will be able to approach approach the system. They sort of they can choose fashion where they can we can select the services they they want to run. Um, so how how do we plan to achieve those goals? Well, so we started off building a platform that is really grounded in this idea of accessibility. Um, we we even for the core stuff we want to we want to have a set of granular. Uh, fairly granular modules uh, that are described uh, in terms of their interfaces, in terms of the data uh, payload they uh, expect and return. Um, and those interfaces are, um, are captured, are well documented, people can share them, people can implement them or re-implement re them if they, if they need to. Um, and that's pretty much the, 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 the basis for the, for the extensibility. Um, we are uh, as some already mentioned, microservices inspired. Uh, microservices, uh, some of you may know, it's like the latest fad in software development. Uh, and in short, it allows you to have to, uh, the, uh, to break up a big uh, monolithic system into a bunch of smaller, uh, smaller elements. And those elements can be developed using different technologies and, and can move in with different velocities uh, and, and, and can be supported by different teams. So we, we like that aspect of the microservices uh, architecture, and we want to uh, make sure that it has a place in our platform. And, and we have some tools and some approaches that, that, that facilitate that. Uh, and finally, the platform has to be cloud-ready from day one. So um, uh, we have already talked about being able to run multi-tenant uh, installations on, on a selective cloud provider. Uh, we want the, the, the system to be cloud uh, provider agnostic, so we can run it in, in different uh, uh, different cloud uh, infrastructures. Um, but at the same time, we understand that uh, a certain number of, of libraries, a certain number of organizations, we want to self-host the system. 
uh, that's why we're also building the system to support that that mode of operation. And um, and uh, I can say on, on the side here that you know we uh, we want to keep the system uh, snappy. We want to keep the system operational even on modest hardware. And we're actually testing some of the components on the Raspberry Pi right now, uh, kind of to keep us honest uh, uh, about this goal. Um, all right, so just a very high-level um, uh, overview of the architecture. We envision the system to be split into roughly three, uh, three levels. Um, uh, the system itself will consist of a, uh, of a, uh, of a container. I'll, the word container is maybe not the best here. I'll, I'll try to uh, say why in a, in a moment. Uh, but the container will uh, grant and provide access to a set of core services. And those, those core services uh, will range uh, from things like uh, persistent access to data, uh, 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 certain models uh, um, and, and data objects that are required in a library system, uh, things like auditing, things like instrumentation, metrics, and so forth. So. Uh, basic set of, uh, of infrastructure, maybe a little bit higher level than infrastructure, but, but a basic set of uh, facilities that, are, uh, that any, uh, any platform uh, like this needs. Uh, those will be replaceable, but they will not be dynamically replaceable. So this is, this is a set that somebody who hosts the system pretty finds um, either a self-hosting organization or a, a cloud uh, hosting provider, uh, and, uh, and they have some dependencies on the, on the infrastructure. Uh, on top of that, we envision um, a layer of business-oriented services, so uh, things that, uh, that provide the core library functionalities. Um, we want them to be able to operate at the scale uh, and, and operate on top of the, the, the core, uh, the system-level services that we provide. Um, and those, in turn, can, can, can define their interfaces and can, can, can work in collaboration with other uh, services and other modules from the same, same level. So it's not only one way, but it's also cross, um, uh, a, a cross-cutting uh, communication. Uh, on top of that, um, uh, we will provide a uh, uh, UI toolkit um, uh, that, will, uh, that will allow us to provide a common look and feel uh, for the platform that will have a, its own um, model of accessibility, so people can focus on providing small snippets, small elements of UI functionality, uh, but will also allow uh, other approaches. Uh, we know that the UI uh, has a short lifespan, uh, and, and, uh, and any, any technology uh, will, uh, will presumably go away in a couple of years, uh, but we want to reuse, uh, reuse the backend stack. Uh, for most of the uh, most most of the evolution of the system, uh, and we want to allow people to create their own uh, UIs and their own approaches to UIs. Um, uh, but the UI toolkit will, uh, from uh, from day one, allow to to provide sort of the the, the common look and feel and uh, uh, and align with with other components in an easy way. Um, so the backend uh, part of the system. Uh, uh, we call it Okapi uh, for an OK API. Uh, it's, you could call it a middleware for the system, but it's not a middleware in the traditional sense of the word. It's more like a switchboard. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that, uh, that the technology, that the architecture is uh, microservices inspired. Uh, what that means is that we, uh, we have a bunch of uh, uh, independent services that collab collaborate on the back end to fulfill requests uh, from the front end. Uh, and we need a system uh, sitting in the middle of it that orchestrates those services, uh, sends requests, combines different requests from from uh, responses. Uh, I'm sorry, from the, from different services uh, to provide uh, to fulfill some business uh, business uh, 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 requests. Um, uh, Okapi Okapi's architecture is inspired by the API gateway pattern. Uh, some of you guys may know it. Uh, that's a fairly popular pattern in the microservices architecture. Uh, but since we're only inspired by that, we have also uh, added a couple of different uh, ideas that we have uh, uh, that we have worked with that we have seen over the years. Uh, uh, we include a simple messaging system. Uh, we have uh, and we have a bunch of. Uh, Secondary, uh, I would say, core services for deployment, uh, uh, for uh, for UI generation, and so forth. I'll, I'll talk about them uh, in a moment. Um, 
so yeah, so that's Wakapi. Uh, it is uh, it is the core, uh, the heart of the platform, uh, uh, and it fulfills the role of a, tra a role that would tradi traditionally be fulfilled by things like an application server. Um, so also Wakapi is a cute animal, a uh, weird animal, I should say, a mixture of a giraffe and, and a zebra. Um, uh, we we like the, the sort of the uh, the play with the word here, but also we had a product previously called Zebra, so it felt like a natural progression. Um, so implementation details uh, um, uh, for Okapi. So Okapi is a job application, but it's built with an extremely fast I/O toolkit uh, called Vertex. Uh, Vertex uh, is one of those new breed Java toolkits that is very lightweight, uh, does not have many dependencies that can, can be easily embedded in your application. Uh, it's not a full-blown application server with, with all the craziness that comes with, uh, with, with, with a fixed deployment schemes and so forth. You can really uh, choose uh, and, and control how you, how you deploy an application built, built with Vertex. Um, it's also uh, asynchronous uh, in its programming model, uh, very similar to Node.js. So some people coding Node.js will be really familiar with this mode of, uh, of programming um, uh, and has full support for Java 8, so for things like Lambdas and, you know, and, 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 and extensions to the language that, that are meant to, uh, to, to, to limit uh, you know, the, the well-known Java verbosity. Um, it's, um, um, uh, it's, of course, an open source uh, project. Um, uh, we uh, drill uh, in Okapi, uh, we rely on HTTP and, and semantics, so pretty much RESTful uh, approach to, to services uh, for, for modules, uh, for modules um, um, uh, protocols, for modules uh, uh, APIs. Uh, it's not to mean that uh, there wouldn't be a way to provide additional, maybe not fully RESTful uh, protocols. Uh, in, in your module, but that's the recommended approach because it allows us uh, to perform certain optimizations and reason a little bit up about how the requests are, uh, are, are processed. Um, so um, we have chosen JSON as the message interchange uh, format. Uh, JSON can be easily consumed, they produce and, and, and different technology stacks uh, in different programming languages. Most of them have uh, support for JSON and, and both HTTP out of the box. Uh, so uh, that feels like a natural choice. Um, we Okapi, uh, uh, besides being a fairly simple API gateway, so so doing uh, performing all, all the functionality that normally an API gateway performs, uh, uh, provide authentication or uh, plugability for authentication and so forth. It also has a, a, a simple um, approach for uh, modeling uh, processing pipelines. Uh, where uh, certain requests can be mapped into multiple multiple backend modules, and then uh, and then a single response can be produced. That's useful for things like uh, subscription to certain events and so forth. Uh, it comes with a built-in event path uh, um, that we use uh, that we use in our application, and that the event bus can be exposed in uh, using many different messaging protocols. So, for example, Storm, MQP, and so forth. So, so again, that's something that can be easily accessed from from pretty much any programming language. Uh, I should also say that Vertex is uh, is built with uh, uh, with this polyglot programming in mind. Uh, uh, on its own, it comes uh, comes with uh, with pretty much uh, with support for pretty much all languages that run on top of JVM. So things like JRuby, uh, JavaScript, uh, Groovy, and so forth. Uh, it's not uh, you're not limited, obviously, to use uh, Vertex uh, uh, on the platform but it's a nice way uh, to provide some of the polyglot approach and, and we'll be providing a bunch of implementation utilities and, uh, and, and boilerplate uh, uh, in the form of a library that can be shared within Vertex project. Uh, I should also say that uh, we're building some of the services with Node.js and, and we'll be planning to, to, to support uh, Node uh, uh, in the best way we can from, from day one too. Um, so interfaces. Um, so as I have already mentioned, um, uh, we have uh, we have we have standardized on, on using uh, uh, RESTful uh, interfaces for JSON payloads. 
um, uh, at least all the core interfaces for Okapi, because Okapi on its own is a uh, collection of, of services. Uh, I'll talk about this in a second. Um, is implemented uh, using this paradigm. Uh, so, uh, so to access all Okapi's functionality, uh, you just need to have a tool that can talk to us. Uh, talk HTTP and, and, and JSON, and that's, that's it. Uh, all uh, interfaces, uh, both for Okapi and for any uh, any core uh, modules, but also for external modules, will be documented and captured in RAML. It's a, um, a RESTful uh, API modeling language. And uh, the JSON schemas uh, are, uh, are being uh, defined and declared using, uh, using JSON schema uh, description language. So, uh, so Okapi and the core services already comes with, with a bunch of uh, descriptions uh, for, for all the services and, and, and their endpoints. Um, and any external modules that we provide will also include those. And here is, uh, that sort of relates to what Seb was saying, where we plan to open, once, once the repositories are opened up, we, uh, we want to encourage people to collaborate on those interfaces. Uh, they can be easily modified. RAML is a really nice syntax to work with. So we hope that the community can, can take over um, um, uh, and maintenance of, of, those, of those interfaces. Um, a overview of core Okapi services. Uh, those services, uh, uh, where you can see the, uh, the, 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 the green ball, that's the, that's the core, um, you could say that the core switchboard that is visible from the outside for, uh, for, for the applications. That's where the, the, the proxying uh, to specific services happens and, and where the, the processing pipelines are executed. Uh, Okapi also comes with, and th that part, I should say, is uh, independent on the hosting environment. We try really hard to have the core software completely independent on the way of launching services, uh, which might be cloud provider specific. Uh, and, and also ways of uh, things, uh, ways of uh, shipping the UI to the client and so forth. So, so this is this is completely headless. This is uh, uh, this is independent uh, from uh, from the cloud provider. Uh, then we have a bunch of uh, uh, supporting core services, uh, things like the discovery service, which which allows us to um, uh, to 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 maintain a list of healthy services, monitor them, and uh, and provide instances. To, uh, to the proxy uh, service uh, to, to proxy to. Um, uh, we have deployment agents that can be installed on, on, on nodes in the cluster uh, where you can uh, use Docker or uh, similar tools uh, to, uh, to launch new services, launch new containers, uh, and, and, uh, and include them in the pool of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of working services. Finally, uh, we have a UI generation service, which, uh, which is implemented in Node uh, and uh, which uh, includes technologies like Webpack um, uh, to produce a, um, a collection of static JavaScript assets that then uh, are sent down to the browser and can be executed as a single page app. I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about the UI and the technology behind the UI in a second. Um, so modules, um, as I have uh, said already, um, uh, this this part of the architecture is microservices inspired, so uh, we uh, we support uh, self-contained HTTP services uh, running running on the backend. Uh, uh, they uh, they can be scaled, so we can run multiple instances of each. Um, uh, we do not uh, enforce any uh, any specific programming technologies. Uh, we uh, we have uh, we have we define an APIs that uh, that the modules need to support uh, certain kinds of APIs for uh, for things like uh, registration, for things like uh, creating instances, but also for things like metrics uh, and so forth. Uh, so uh, a developer guide will include a list of all those interfaces that a module. Uh, uh, that, that a service to become a module needs to support, but we do not enforce any approach to, uh, to the implementation stack uh, or any choice of implementation stack. Uh, that's that's all all up to uh, the development team. Um, however, we'll provide we'll have uh, a first class support, I should say, for 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 Vertex and Node.js 
uh, and we'll, we'll release libraries that will, uh, will make it very easy to, uh, to build modules in those languages. But again, uh, if somebody wants to use Python, that's still possible. Uh, somebody wants to use Ruby, uh, that's, that's also possible. What needs to be done is, is that the application needs to be packaged in a container so we can, uh, we can easily handle the, uh, all dependencies um, uh, this way and, and, and has to be described with, uh, with, 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 um, with, uh, with descriptors, um, uh, JSON, uh, JSON formatted descriptors that I'll talk about in a second and that Kurt will show you um, uh, on, on the screen. Um, core modules, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, that's those core modules, they're system level modules. Uh, it's a collection of, uh, of, 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 uh, of modules that will be provided with the platform. They're, they are replaceable, but not dynamically replaceable. They will provide access to things like, like uh, things like persistency. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, for example, Patreon, uh, Patreon data, uh, bibliographic data, um, uh, circulation data, and so forth. Uh, it's not to say that uh, additional uh, additional models or, or objects cannot be defined. Uh, they can. Uh, we'll have support for that. But, uh, but but out of the box, you'll be able to start writing uh, applications without worrying too much about how the data is stored and so forth. Um, external modules, uh, so that's where, where we see most of the collaboration happening. Um, uh, again, can be written in any language. Uh, need to support, uh, need to provide, the first, first of all, need to provide um, uh, uh, interfaces in a certain way. Uh, we'll, we'll have guidelines ready for, for you know, how, how those interfaces should look like. Need to support some, uh, some, some APIs for metrics and so forth. But other than that, they're totally free to, to do whatever. Uh, they need to be stateless. Uh, so, uh, so the guides will also talk about, about what, what that means in practice. Uh, so they can be easily all balanced and, and we can scale the system on, on the cloud um, infrastructure. Um, on the in the UI, uh, uh, we're as I have uh, uh, as you can see on the on the on the first uh, diagram, we uh, we are working on a UI toolkit, uh, code name Stripes. Uh, um, the UI toolkit is built on uh, two pretty popular uh, JavaScript technologies, uh, browser technologies, React and Redux. Um, but we want to simplify uh, some of the aspects of, of dealing with React. So we don't want to hide it, um, uh, especially React has a fairly simple and nice to use component model. Uh, we want to retain it, uh, but Redux can be tricky uh, to use and, 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 and state handling with Redux can be tricky. So, so we want to have a more declarative approach uh, to state handling, to retrieving data uh, from backend services. And, uh, and that's what, uh, what Stripes will offer, an easy way to, uh, to express data needs in a form of a manifest and, 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 and handle all the clue and, and the boilerplate that, that, that needs to be handled when, when you deal with Redux. Um, so uh, the generated, uh, the generated um, um, uh, UI is a SPA, so a single page app. Uh, uh, built with React and Redux, it, uh, it will be tenant specific because uh, because uh, the modules uh, or different components uh, representing different elements of the UI, they will have dependencies on the backend services, and they will be uh, they will be uh, you'll be able to select that, uh, select them as a tenant, uh, and uh, what you end up with after that selection is a is a bundle, a new bundle of of, uh, of a user interface uh, that can be done uh, generated and, and downloaded to the, to the browser. Um, the UI, uh, UI components, UI modules, uh, collection, I should say collection of components is what uh, module will be uh, on the client side uh, is decoupled from the server side, uh, from, the, from the backend. Uh, uh, it uses those uh, well-defined interfaces that we have, to, that we have talked about um, uh, and needs to clearly express uh, their uh, dependencies on those interfaces, so, so including things like versioning, including things like uh, um, uh, 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 certain rights uh, and, and so forth, um, uh, well, which will allow us to, to support and, and provide uh, provide uh, backend back services, make, make sure that backend services are available for that kind of uh, UI. Um, I mentioned a couple of times, uh, this is a fairly convoluted diagram, but I, I've mentioned a couple of different descriptors that we have in the system. 
Uh, again, uh, Craig will we'll talk about those in a moment. Um, each module in the Folio ecosystem needs to come with, 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 with a descriptor. That descriptor uh, gives us information or lets the platform uh, know about things like, uh, like the, the metadata associated with the module, so its name and, and description and so forth. Uh, interface, it's interface and contract, so, so things relating to RAML and, and JSON schemas. Uh, also, uh, in a versioned way, because we need to be able to, to upgrade uh, services uh, while the system is running, uh, we need to be able to, uh, to, to reason about the dependencies and so forth. So, um, uh, 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 so finally, a module script will also include a certain set of rules uh, uh, required for the, uh, for the module to operate and also uh, rule uh, um, uh, permissions that, uh, that, that any user wanting to access the module or any, uh, any client wanting to access the module on behalf, behalf of that user uh, needs, to, needs to include. Um, uh, the module descriptors uh, will um, link or include uh, uh, two, uh, two, two different descriptors specific to the kind of module uh, we're describing with the descriptor, so either a client-side module or a server-side module. Uh, for the server-side module, the deployment descriptor is the thing that talks about how to launch uh, services, uh, uh, how to uh, uh, down to the bare metal, how, how to how to launch processes if we're using uh, a very simple uh, mode of operation, or how to how to uh, launch containers where we talk about Docker. Uh, for the UI, the UI descriptor is modeled on top of uh, npm uh, descriptors and includes some additional metadata that the UI um, uh, that the UI uh, modularity needs uh, when when the process of uh, of generating the UI is performed. Um, uh, but other than other, otherwise, it should be fairly familiar to people working with NPM uh, and, 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 and JavaScript uh, in general. Um, all right, so I should probably move on. Um, Jacob, uh, I just want to uh, uh, point discreetly at uh, the time right now. All right, uh, let me. How much time do I have left? Uh, or should I just pretty much finish already? Well, uh, yeah, you want to leave some time for for Kurt and for questions. So, so. Yep. All right, uh, let me just wrap up quickly. So, uh, so uh, the, the set of core services you have seen, uh, they're meant to provide some building blocks for the app store. Uh, we did not uh, fully imagine how the app store is going to look like, how, 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 how the application is going to be shared, but we want to approach it so that this, this can be shuffled. This can, you, can, you can choose how, how, the, how, the, how, how the app store is being realized. Um, Finally, the timeline uh, for the project. So early fall 2016, we'll, uh, we're planning an uh, initial uh, initial uh, code release, so uh, so the, the repos will be opened. Uh, Peter will, uh, will talk more about this, and then uh, uh, going on from, uh, from from there, we'll be working both on apps and then on reaching a platform uh, uh, based on the feedback from, from developers and users. Um, and I, uh, I think Peter will also cover uh, our uh, our GitHub. Um, we have a collection of repos where uh, different pro projects are, are being held. Uh, but I'll, I guess we'll we'll talk more about this later. All right, Kurt. Um, sorry, and uh, over to you. Thanks, Jakob. So um, what what I'm going to try to do here is to just give a a, um, a brief overview of kind of the um, I don't know you call it the the sausage making um, uh, procedure of, of creating a module and uh, deploying it on on a copy, and the, what I'm hoping to convey here is that it's actually a very simple process. Um, I know we've we've done um, a lot of things out here. I'm um, just giving you kind of the bird's eye view of our technology stack and how things fit together. Correct, correct. And uh, some of it when you first. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I I just wanted to remind you to share your screen at some point. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Turn dropped. All right, no problem. Um, actually, I don't, I don't have a lot of pretty slides. I'm going to be showing you some, some code and some descriptors. I'm going to go ahead and just switch to my screen uh, so we're ready to go, uh, go with that. Um, but um, we're just, just going to take a look at making a very simple module. And um, OK, well, here's my beginning here. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and jump to it. So we need a. Um, a module is basically just going to be a web application that's going to follow some conventions. And um, we're going to have some pieces of metadata. We're going to attach to these modules, um, namely the module descriptor and the deployment descriptor to, to tell uh, the gateway how to, how to treat the module, how to deploy them. 
Um, we taught um, both uh, both Jakob and Sebastian mentioned that it is a, a polyglot system, meaning that Okapi speaks HTTP, so it doesn't really care what the module happens to be running in, um, which means that um, you know if you, if if you if your group is a Python group, if your group is a Node group, if you if you like Java a lot, um, you know whatever um, development environment works well. Um, we want we don't we don't want you to have to have the barrier of learning a whole new development environment to start making modules for um, for Folio. So um, in this case, I'm going to I'm going to use um, Express, uh, the web framework for Node. Um, internally, we typically use Vertex for most of our things. Um, I'm using Express here because it, it's uh, uh, it's brevity, and if you look at the code, it's very simple to understand. And just also just to demonstrate that that even though Okapi itself is built on Vertex and Java. Um, you don't need to worry about um, learning that stack if, if it's not something that's beneficial for your group. Uh, we, we found it to be a very good stack, and, and, and it serves us well, and we're going to be supporting it well. But at the same time, um, if it's not your stack, if it's not something you want to use, um, that's fine. There are, there are other things, you know, plenty of other options uh, for you to go. So. Um, we're going to need to do a couple of things um, with this, as a copy. We're going to have to have a copy. We're going to need to deploy the app. We're going to need to um, make a copy aware of the app running, and we're going to have to provide the rules for how a copy is going to provide proxy access to this uh, to this module. And then we're going to have to associate it with the tenant. Um, a copy is built in a, a modular way so that um, it, it can do the services for you, but potentially um, if if down the road, it becomes advantageous to have an external service handle things like deployment or discovery. Um, it, it, can, it can allow those to be done externally as well. But for this example, we're just going to assume that a copy is going to handle all of that. So uh, let's just talk about the module that we're going to be um, building here. It, it's very simple, and it has really nothing to do with library technology, and that's intentional because I didn't want to um, have any um, any any conventions or buzzwords or anything that might distract from just just the base that we're trying to do. So so this is going to be a web application that's going to do uh, restful crud of JSON objects. Um, we're calling these objects things, and I'll just give a show here an example of what these things. Um, let's see, I had a uh, list here of. Things look like if uh, the screen would stop. Okay, so let me make this a little bigger here. So here we have some um, samples of, of things that you might get. So each thing has a name, has a purpose, and a secret power. Um, again, nothing to do with not a library technology here, but just to show you what we're trying to do. So you you can either um, ask the app to store a thing for you, or you can ask the app to um, to return a thing that's already been stored and retrieve it. Um, basically, uh, you know, storage retrieval. And, and this instance, we're just doing in-memory storage. We're not worrying about back-end storage or anything like that, or persistence, which we will be providing uh, core system modules to handle that kind of functionality as well. So um, that'll be a, a more advanced topic, but that's something that will be provisioned and um, you know available through the base of copy system to to give you that kind of functionality um, uh, um, as we as we uh, show the code. Um, but in, in this case, we're just going to be um, just doing basic storage here. So here we have uh, these things that we're storing, and, and the code um, to to do that is very simple. It's about a hundred and uh, change here, but it's just an express code, and I'll just scroll through it really quickly. Um, we just jump down to the bottom uh, just to to get to the meat of it. So we have an express app that we're creating here. Uh, we, we create a parser to read in the JSON from a put or a post. Uh, we have a router that, that, that just routes it to the, to, to the, uh, to the basic um, URL. And we're listening to two different URLs. We're listening to the things URL and the things URL with a, followed by a name. Um, and th those are to handle either get or post or, or put or delete uh, requests, uh, respectively, um, from from where you might um, interact with that. So, um, if you go ahead and just run this module by itself, it'll just it'll just run as a, as a web application, and you know you can you can post things to it, or you can get things to it. 
and and that all works on its own outside of of Okapi. You know, um, it, it runs standalone if you would want it to. Now, for actually integrating with Okapi, you need to do a few more things. Um, it needs to be able to run on the system that that Okapi is running on. In, in, a, in a in a in a real world system uh, system, you probably want to run something like a, like a Docker container, and then have um, Okapi manage the starting and stopping of these containers. Um, if you're just doing it in development or just you know want to um, start playing with this, uh, which you'll be able to do very soon, um, you can just make sure that the the application is going to run on on your base system and just just run it uh, straight there. Like I said, Okapi just really wants to talk to the HTTP. It doesn't care a whole lot about the um, implementation details there. So um, we'll get to the uh, deployment descriptor. Um, this would be the first thing you would have to send to Okapi here to to make it work. So again, it's a very small um, piece of JSON here. You have this. Um, service ID to tell it the name of the module, and then you just have a descriptor, and that tells Okapi what it needs to do to get this module running. Um, in this case, it's just a node command. It could also be um, a Docker um, start or stop command. Um, you know, you can you can specify uh, what to do when the when the node starts and what to do when the module stops. Um, but in this case, it's just a, just, a, just a little command line switch to say start this module with node. And, and what that does is it lets Okapi um, go ahead and get the module running. You'll notice in this string there's this little um, percent %p um, symbol in there. And what that is is uh, it, it tells Okapi uh, replace this with the, no, with the port that you want this module to run on. So the module itself. Um, on the command line can receive a port designator and then Okapi can pass it that. And by doing so, not only does it deploy the module, but it allows Okapi to discover the module as well. So now Okapi can start it and also knows uh, where the module is running so that when you go to the next step, which is proxying the module, um, Okapi already knows um, where to find it, which is uh, important. So the next thing you need to do is you need to tell Okapi uh, the rules for handling this module. You need to tell it what endpoints are defined, and you need to tell it, um, you know, what permissions are going to be needed. Or you also need to tell it how it interacts with other modules in the system. Um, you know, does it have requirements of other modules? Uh, do other modules depend upon it, possibly? And to do that, we need something that uh, we call the the module descriptor, which is another um, piece that we uh, let's see. Okay, so we're going to look at the module descriptor here, and I'll just run through that to show you the various pieces of it. Uh, you need the ID um, for for what the, for you know what the module is. It has a name, and then also this this provides object, and that um, is is to tell other other modules um, what this module is providing in the system. So you might also have a requires object, which this one doesn't have, but other ones might that look for a specific um, uh, name and version that are being provided by other modules so that uh, you can have one module dependent upon one or more other modules be being present in the system and that this can be checked at runtime to make sure that you have the proper dependencies. Um, so then we're going to look at the routing entries, which is how we tell Okapi um, how this module is to be proxied and um, what the permissions are for things to access it there. So we have um, a number of different routing entries. They define a collection of methods that a particular entry can take. There's a path um, that each one can be accessed at. Uh, there's a field called level, which is basically um, the priority at which it gets um, uh, handled. And in, in, the, in the instance that you would have more than one module mapped to the same path and method, uh, the, the level would tell a copy um, which one to, to send the request to first before it gets passed along the chain. Uh, there's a type field um, which tells a copy what kind of response to expect from this, from this module um, routing entry. It could just be a header only. Um, it could just be, um, it could just take a request or, or it could take a request and expect a response, which is what we have here. Um, and then finally, we have two permissions related fields. We have one called permissions required, and we have another called permissions desired. And what those do is those inform Okapi what 
permissions this um, entry is interested in. If it's a required permission, that means that the incoming request has to have that permission assigned to it, otherwise a copy is not even going to pass along to the module. Um, if it's a desired permission, that means that if the permission is there, a copy will pass it along, but it's not necessary. It's more of a semantic permission, meaning that the module itself is going to receive that permission if it exists, but it will be up to the module to decide how it is going to um, handle that. Um, you'll see that we actually have a number of different uh, routing entries defined here, and they all have the same path, but they have different uh, methods for each one, and they each have a different permissions required. So if you want to um, just uh, you know, get a list of all the things you require to have the thing read permission, if you want to add a new thing, you need to have the thing create permission. Uh, they all are actually interested in the same desired permission, which is the thing C sensitive permission. And what that means is that um, that's the permission that they'll function with if you don't have it, but the module will behave differently depending upon its own internal business logic on whether or not that permission is there. Um, the actual mechanism for populating that, these permissions is that there is a, a header. Um, let me switch back to the code here. Hey everyone, this is Peter. I think we might have lost Kurt. Uh, we'll see if he comes in in just a moment. Should we take a, um, a few questions uh, while Kurt is possibly restarting his, uh, his VM? Uh, either that, Sebastian, or I can uh, talk about the uh, community pieces. Uh, uh, let's, Peter, let's have you talk about the community pieces because uh, some of the questions that have come in have been about uh, timelines and and when we'll see stuff, and, and so I think you'll be able to answer that um, with your presentation. Okay, uh, if you could pass the ball to me then. Mike, you might need to do that since uh, we've lost Kurt. Thank you. Let me bring up my window here. Uh, so a little bit about uh, the developer engagement. Uh, as Sebastian said, we're hoping to make this fun for developers. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, we need to have some uh, strategies for engaging people. Uh, first of all, some of the, the uh, code tools themselves. Uh, we're going to have a developer preview of the platform in late uh, next month. Uh, this will be on GitHub, and Jacob uh, talked about some of the code repositories that will be on GitHub. Uh, a word about the, uh, the code that will be there. Uh, this, when, when we say developer preview, we're talking about a developer preview of the Okapi platform itself, uh, plus some uh, sample applications that are running on that platform. Uh, as Sebastian uh, talked about in his introduction, uh, we are moving fast. 
uh, and learning quickly. Uh, so at this point, we don't have uh, a full-fledged uh, ILS functionality when we talk about a developer preview. Uh, the developer preview that we're talking about is the Okapi platform itself, uh, upon which we'll build over the next 18 months uh, some of those traditional ILS uh, uh, modules, uh, as well as modules that fall outside of the traditional ILS. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about that in a moment uh, when we talk about the special interest groups. We are using GitHub as the uh, the uh, code repository. Uh, you won't find those GitHub repos right now. Uh, they are still private uh, as we finish up uh, the, the first development push uh, for the developer preview and the documentation for that. Uh, so look for announcements about that uh, coming next month. We're also standing up a JIRA instance for issues and a Confluence instance for the wiki. In terms of communications, there's a couple things in place now and a couple things that are coming. Uh, you might have seen the folio underscore LSP Twitter account now. Uh, that's a more general Twitter account for anyone that's interested in, in following along with the project. Uh, we're going to have a developer-oriented Twitter account uh, coming soon uh, with which we'll announce uh, things that are more developer-oriented uh, and also plug some of the automation from uh, the uh, build pipeline uh, into that Twitter account so you can uh, follow along with, uh, with activity on the development side. There are some mailing lists right now at lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Uh, there's a general folio list and a developer list. Uh, we're also in the process of standing up a web forum using the discourse platform, uh, and the web address for that is discuss.openlibraryfoundation.org. Uh, we're also on Freenode at the uh, Folio channel. Uh, and finally, talking about uh, broader community engagement. Uh, as Sebastian talked about, uh, Index Data is building the core platform, uh, but then what the community does with that uh, is in, in large part uh, up to the needs of the community. Uh, so in order to facilitate that process, we're forming some special interest groups uh, on topics like uh, the, the functional matrix, uh, things that are, uh, are held in common that the platform must do for people. Uh, resource management, uh, we talk actually about this as uh, star resource management because we want to think about uh, physical objects as well as uh, electronic objects and how we manage those, uh, what workflows are in common and what workflows are specific to each type of material. Uh, we're talking with ARL uh, about partnering with them on an accessibility uh, special interest group. Uh, one that is, is focused on making sure that the user interface is accessible uh, and that uh, all of the, and providing tooling to, to help make all of the, the components of the system accessible. Uh, linked data is a popular topic now, and so we want to have a special interest group about how linked data uh, intersects with the folio system. Uh, and then start to branch out from things that are kind of outside the traditional ILS, uh, how the platform can be used to help with teaching and learning goals, how the platform can be used uh, to further goals in scholarly communication. Uh, and then also in that consortial area, uh, how the, the platform can be deployed consortially, 
how functionality can be deployed consortially, uh, how different folio instances can talk to each other in an interconsortial relationship, uh, those type of topics. Uh, Olay, of course, is going to continue its biweekly forms. The next one is on OKB in two weeks, uh, and two weeks after that, we're planning one on uh, the user experience and user interface design related to Folio. Uh, and then on folio.org, we're going to have a calendar of events uh, where you can see where there will be, uh, where Folio will be talked about, uh, and where Olay and EBSCO and Index Data. Uh, staff will be present uh, and you can hear more about the project. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn it back over to Kurt, uh, and after that, we'll have some questions and answers. Uh, I do want to point out that we have a question and answer webinar tomorrow, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. It's about 40 hours from now. Uh, we're trying something a little different. Uh, we see that there is uh, global interest in the Folio platform, uh, so we scheduled this webinar to be helpful to those in Europe and uh, uh, Africa and the Middle East. Uh, but we know that those on in the Pacific U.S. and along the Pacific Rim, Australia, uh, this is not a convenient time. Uh, and so we're going to put the recording of this session up and then have a follow-up question and only question and answer only webinar uh, next uh, tomorrow, uh, where those audiences can uh, participate in this as well. Uh, again, this is something new that we're trying, so you will receive a survey, uh, and one of the questions on that survey will be whether this format uh, makes sense to you, whether it's uh, easy for you, and whether you have any other suggestions for us. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to pass the WebEx ball back to Kurt. Uh, welcome back, Kurt, uh, and you can continue your presentation. Uh, Kurt, you have yourself muted at the moment. Terribly sorry. All right, so uh, here I am. Um, we're going to uh, just try to wrap this up um, in an expedient manner. Uh, we're going to try to try to take the content, uh, put into a blog post or something similar, so that it's um, available for um, uh, perusal at, at a more leisurely pace. Um, but I'm just going to jump right back into where we left off, talking about the permissions. And, and Kurt, I just wanted to. Uh, Kurt, sorry, I need yes? to interrupt. Uh, you need to share your screen again, please. All right, I'll run it up. All right, so we're going to. Uh, here's this. Um, Take a look at the code here real quick. And um, let's jump over to where we are. All right, so we're going to go back uh, to looking just at the permissions. And really, the only thing we're doing here is I just want to show you um, what, what's involved in just checking the permissions for, for a, a defined module. And all we're doing here is um, we're, just, we're just looking for this Excel copy permissions header. That, that is provided <clears throat> to the module, it has a list of all the permissions in it. And all we're doing is checking to see if this thing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, see since the permission is, is present. And um, this permission is um, provided by both Okapi and the, um, the core authentication module, uh, authentication slash authorization module. So that is actually happens at the system level, and, and it's uh, secure, and, and, and it's made sure that it can't be spoofed. But I just want to make uh, you aware of, of the fact that permissions handling uh, from the de module developer point of view is, is quite simple. So we have our permissions defined in, in the module descriptor. So the actual process of what it looks like to, to de deploy this module um, it's pretty simple. So you'll have a copy running. Uh, we'll, we'll say it's running at somewhere like a copyhost.org, uh, port 9130 uh, is the default Okapi um, uh, port. And then we'll, we'll have the module um, available on the, the, the 
uh, the, the host system where, where a copy is able to uh, see it at, um, at the command line, be it in a container or just, uh, you know, uh, raw metal. And then we're going to send the deployment descriptor to, the, to a copy. We'll just post that to a copy's um, administrative um, interface. Um, it's a straight uh, REST call there, um, and then Okapi will, will, will get that descriptor, and with that it will deploy and make the module available to discovery. Uh, following that, we, we would um, send our, uh, so we send the deployment descriptor, then we would send the um, module descriptor itself. Uh, we post that to Okapi, and with that Okapi would, would apply these rules to the, to the module that's already been um, been deployed, and uh, at that point, the module would then be, be available um, through uh, to be proxied. So you would be able to just go to the Okapi host slash 9130 slash things and immediately start interacting with this module. So, um, and that that's really uh, the, the the heart of it. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't touch on the, the whole packaging um, aspect um, or, or that, but in terms of just getting started developing modules, um, that's really the meat and that, that's really uh, the interaction that happens. So uh, really a very low barrier to entry and like I said, we'll have this um, in documentation, we'll have further examples, hopefully we'll have um, more example docu um, modules and, and, and a variety of different uh, frameworks just to, just to uh, serve as example code. And um, you know, like I said, the, the we'll we'll put this in in a, in a blog post or something so you can kind of see all the steps here. Uh, but hopefully, uh, very simple to get a copy running and then just start building some things um, and try it out. Uh, now, I did I was going to turn this back over to uh, Jakob for the to talk just a little bit about the UI. Um, uh, don't know how we are doing on time, uh, but I'll go ahead and relinquish the the um, the mic now and and, um, and let um, let's talk about the next phase in line. All right, uh, well, thanks, thanks, Kurt, and all the other panelists. Um, so we have 15 minutes for questions, so um, I'll move right along. Um, and, and I apologize in advance, there, there have been far too many questions to answer in that time frame. Um, but uh, let's get started. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, this was in, the platform was inspired by microservices, but took a departure uh, from a pure microservice um, philosophy. Can you expand on, on, on what that departure is and what that means for the platform? So I'll, I'll, I'll ask Jakob if he has more to say. From, from my perspective, and, and my perspective is, is, is probably sort of at a 20,000 foot view and maybe incorrect, but the, the big departure thing is really um, the fact that Okapi is involved in each transaction between two different modules. So as control passes from module to module, Okapi is involved as the gatekeeper and as the place where we can um, we can ascertain that um, that requests are permitted by the current tenant, but also a place where we can do monitoring and logging and so on. Um, so my my sense is in in, in sort of a a strictly orthodox microservices approach if such a thing exists, um, you wouldn't have an API gateway involved between uh, the different modules. Jakob, uh, do you want to add anything to that? Or, or yeah, I, that? I think you've captured it well. I, I, I think another sort of but fairly low, low technical, low level tech, uh, technicality of, of our approach is that we will most likely have a shared storage mechanism, uh, which, you know, in the Fundamentalist uh, microservices architecture is, 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 is usually something uh, uh, that is not followed. Uh, microservices tend to own their own storage, but we need to have we need to we need to have a way to share data, and we need to have a way to uh, uh, to, to to ensure that data is shareable and have some common models uh, and, and also common uh, common layer of of, of, of uh, handling access to that data. So. Um, yeah, so for a data sensitive system, a shared, uh, shared storage upload seems, seems like a better solution. Well, and also because we, we would like to have a notion of, of, of shared data models, right? So in, yeah. in, in microservices, there's often an idea that you really deal in these vertical slices, and, and vertical slices are fine, but we feel like there is value in having a kind of shared notion of 
of objects like uh, you know, patrons, uh, inventory, your model for KB, and so on. So, so we want to provide those as part of the substrate, if you will. Okay, thank you. I think that leads well into our next question, um, which which I'll combine combine the ideas of several questions. Uh, several people were interested in in how the the components that are part of the minimum viable product will will shape the shared data model, and you know uh, will, how much isolation will be, there be between the components, so that decisions that were made for one of them won't won't hamstring. Uh, the necessary development for other components. So that's a that's a really good question, um, and so we've 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 mentioned several times here that up to this point, development has really focused very much on the um, uh, on the platform itself. We've had a parallel process of of trying to develop a model for what uh, what should the what should that sort of initial set of apps be if we think of the app store sort of parallel on a cell phone you know on a smartphone what's the what's the set of apps that comes with a phone or that that makes it behave or, or let it let it do the, the the things that it needs to do at a base level um so we have a process about that and, and we're going to speak a lot more about that in a forum in a, in a uh, the, the, the one after the next in four weeks um, in terms of, of, of how the data models are impacted by the apps as they're developed and how do we sort of avoid, uh, uh, I'd say one, one risk that I might take away from that question would be this notion of, of breaking, breaking backwards compatibility, breaking, uh, you know, you, we change one data model and what are the unforeseen consequences for, for apps that depend on that data model and so on as different teams are working in parallel. So there's a couple of things. One of them is, um, I mentioned early on when I started that the interfaces that are exposed by these base data models are viewed as, as, as critical pieces of the infrastructure. So we want to maintain those with some of the same rigor that you might apply to a standard protocol or a standard API, which in fact is what they are. So, so they will be maintained. Uh, most likely in GitHub in, 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 some, in some repository as, as shared objects that people can refer to. Uh, they will be versioned with major and, uh, and, and minor version numbers so that you can add extensions that are backwards compatible without um, uh, and, and bump your minor version number. Uh, so you, you, you have some control sort of sense of, of progressing or extending something with, say, optional elements without breaking um, existing apps. When something needs to change fundamentally, you'd bump, you'd bump the major version number and so on. Um, we'd like to see that same principle applied in the interfaces that people put on application logic, uh, so the types of modules that, um, um, that, that Kurt was sort of digging into building. So every time there's an interface, we'd like to treat it as something that should be, that should be cared for. And there's different kind of schools of thoughts about how you would maintain those. Um, our thinking is that the best way to maintain those is, 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 is as a group of developers talking together. So we'd like to approach maintaining those interfaces. That's, that's our view at this point, at least early on, um, as, as something that's maintained as a, as a shared thing. So as people start to build apps, let's say that they find that there's something missing in a core data model for a patron, um, they will either extend that model or they will talk to us or somebody else who's maintaining that data model and it gets extended. Um, everybody needs to make every effort to make that change backwards compatible, um, but the data model then gets updated at that point. Um, and we do expect early on to be breaking things. Uh, so we, we've had this notion that you know, as we start building apps on this platform, as we start really testing it, things will break. The, 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 the first couple of months, the first three, four, five, six months of working on this platform is going to be very interesting. And, and, and people will probably have to be alert to the fact that things will change. But our expectation is also that it will start to stabilize as, as more apps are built, as we, as we sort of grasp the domain model better and so on. So that's a roundabout way of asking, of, of answering, but I, I, I think one, one kind of way to sum it up is that these models need to be maintained with great care. We see them as, as really first class citizens of the universe of this. I hope that helps some. All right, uh, I, I, I hope so too, thanks. Um, so uh, moving, moving on, uh, we've had a couple questions come in both about um, you know, 
HTTP was mentioned as being you know, the default way to, to hook things together. Um, so questions around that were, uh, is that the, is that, will, will that be the only way of, of hooking modules together? And then uh, given that it's uh, HTTP is stateless, how do, we, how do we plan to handle transactions? Jakob, do you want to address this? So, um, so HTTP was selected because it, it is most likely the most popular protocol with uh, you know out of the box support and and, and pretty much any uh, imaginable uh, uh, technolo technology stack. Uh, it's it not necessarily the only protocol that will be supported. I also mentioned that we will uh, will have uh, gateways uh, uh, for certain messaging protocols to hook into some 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 events uh, that the system fires off at different times. Uh, uh, but uh, but as things look like right now, HTTP seems to do the trick. We've also run pretty extensive uh, performance uh, uh, tests uh, on top of Vertex and, and, and seeing how the proxying and for request forwarding will work, and it seems to scale uh, nicely. So we don't have any um, uh, any any problems with that. So so for now, HTTP uh, uh, remains the core uh, protocol uh, unless unless we need to change because uh, something pops up. Um, uh, the other part of the question was about transactions. Um, uh, that's a pretty large topic, so I don't think I can answer that here. But uh, but 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 in short, we we hope to limit uh, the number of uh, transactions by uh, by uh, selecting proper uh, boundaries uh, between modules uh, and and hide uh, any, any any transactions behind uh, behind single resources, uh, if that's possible. In cases where it's not possible, or if then we'll we'll need to handle that case by case basis. But uh, I think that's, that's as much as I can say uh, here. Uh, for any other questions, I think we should follow, uh, for, for, for more information about that, we should probably follow up on, on our mailing list. All right, uh, thanks. Um, so, uh, we, what, what, what will be available for um, privacy security concerns uh, and how that relates to the collaboration duality? It's, uh, I'm not sure whether the question refers to like some technical aspects of that or whether the collaboration. Uh, I can I can just I, say that. I, I uh, think it well. You know, I, I'm interpreting the question, and, and uh, perhaps the questioner will clarify. But I think I think it's related to the technical aspects. Um, as far as technical aspect is concerned, uh, uh, we uh, we are building a model for uh, for user roles and and permissions uh, that will be part of the core system. Uh, it's partially uh, it's something that is a cross cutting concern, so it's partially implemented by Del Copy itself, and then uh, uh, exact details about how the permissions are handled and 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 and, and, and so forth are, are being delegated to, to external modules. Uh, the system, the platform uh, from day one will come with a with a module uh, that implements a basic scheme uh, for both authentication and authorization, but that scheme will be replaceable. Uh, so, so both their bits that are core to the platform and 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 we hope uh, well we hope to keep them as limited as possible and and, and not very opinionated, but they need to be there. And, and bits that are uh, that are extensible by, uh, by 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 plugging a different module uh, um, to avoid having to rewrite uh, the sort of uh, whole uh, authentication slash authorization handling. We'll also provide a module that has some uh, some pluggable uh, uh, backend uh, authentication option options like you know single sign-on systems and uh, and things like uh, hooking up to an Active Directory and so forth. Uh, so one, one, one quick point I'd, I'd make uh, to attach to that, because there's sort of lots of different access, uh, sort of ways of approach of discussing uh, uh, security and, 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 and privacy. One point I'd make is that um, although we're developing the code at index data, uh, uh, EBSCO is, is very much kind of following along as a member of, of this community and with a particular interest in, in one day being able to uh, host this for customers. In different uh, um, 
in different countries and different regions uh, and on a cloud-based infrastructure. So, so there is a, a sort of separate tracker concern about security and what the posture needs to be from the, from the perspective of the project as a whole and how that ultimately will unfold into to sort of guidelines for developers and so on. So, so there, is, there is kind of a, a, a well-defined activity within the project to think about security that's very much driven by uh, by their needs to operate ultimately a, a cloud service on this and other people as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in um, uh, two more that are hopefully, you know, a few word answer questions and that's um, what will be the this centralized data store and um, what's the plan for translations internationalization? Uh, I'm just not uh, quickly talking about the centralized data store. Um, it's not that it will be a single centralized data store, but most likely a collection of modules that in implement persistency. Um, uh, and by saying that, I, uh, what I meant to say was that that's something that will be offered by the platform. So, so the modules will not, uh, uh, will not need to implement persistency on their own as long as, uh, as their needs can be sat satisfied by, by those modules. Those modules will be, will be largely reflect uh, the boundaries of, uh, of, 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 of the domain. Uh, so things like patrons and, and, and bits and stuff being, uh, being separate uh, services. Um, uh, and the other question was about internal nationalization. So um, uh, there will be support for that. Uh, we'll, we'll be reusing some of, especially in the UI, uh, some existing approaches. Um, we actually have uh, a usability expert who's, who's uh, working uh, and I, uh, quite, quite, quite closely to that and then being aware of, of, of the needs. Uh, so, so I think he can also try to follow up on on more details, uh, but yeah, it is being considered, and it's it's, it's being in some way uh, part of the August uh, um, or the early fall uh, um, uh, release. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, so I'd like to thank our panelists, and especially everyone who participated and asked questions in the forum. As a reminder, um, in case you know people who didn't make it, or uh, we'll have another session that will just be Q and A tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, which I believe is. 2300 UTC. Um, please follow the website and other four that we mentioned. Uh, the next regularly scheduled community forum will be about Go KB. Um, so thanks everyone and see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone. Great to have you participating today.